Hey everyone, me again, Laszlo Montgomery, part two this time, the Honorable British East India Company. As I mentioned, this is sort of a free giveaway I had stored away in the archive. I did this originally for Cathay Pacific in 2017. It's an accompaniment piece to the BBC miniseries Taboo, starring Tom Hardy. This episode's been running already for about six months, and I thought I'd add it to our CHP roster of episodes. I guess it belongs more in the India history podcast, but I hope you don't mind that I'm presenting it here. So without any further wasting of your valuable history podcast listening time, here's part two of the British East India Company. It was around 1720 that tea became a drink not only for the swells, but for the working stiffs in England's factories, mines, and shops as well. That's when it started to become the national drink. And this growth in the tea trade dovetailed nicely with the West Indies sugar trade. Tea and sugar. What a combination. Yeah, tea was becoming very important to the company. And as it got later and later into the 18th century, it became the most important commodity of trade. And not just to the company, to the crown as well. The taxes brought in by the EIC tea trade brought a permanent smile on the face of the exchequer. But the taxes on East India Company tea were pretty high. And this, of course, led to a legion of interlopers who also engaged in the tea trade and smuggled it inside Britain to steal business from the company. Was the EIC ever going to get to enjoy that monopoly? The Seven Years' War, 1754-1763 saw Britain and France locked in struggle not only in Europe, but in India as well. The two East India companies of those nations fought a very aggressive and nasty war in India as well. These were the Carnatic Wars. The Carnatic region in India was in the south, the states of Tamil Nadu and parts of Karnataka and Kerala states. These battles between the two nations' companies in India were terribly fierce, with the British EIC even losing their stronghold in Madras for several years. Ultimately, however, these Carnatic Wars ended up in favor of the British EIC, and they emerged as the top European power in India, and it would stay that way for a while. It was a major setback for France and India. These Carnatic Wars were a turning point for the EIC. After everything that had transpired on the continent and in India, with such intense fighting all over southern India, this is where the EIC starts becoming a military force in addition to a group of merchants engaging in the import, export, and shipping business. And perfectly timed with the gradual militarization of the EIC was the rapid decay of the Mughal Empire. By 1750... All that was left was a Indian subcontinent of regional powers. The company took stock of the situation and got ready to gorge itself on its winnings. But there were setbacks. When Siraj Udawla became the Nawab of Bengal, he decided to show a little backbone against the company's assault on India's dignity. He was the last independent Nawab of Bengal. Once the company puts him away... All future Bengali Nawabs will be kept safely inside the EIC's pocket. In June 1756, the Nawab's forces will take Calcutta and even storm Fort William. From this act of seizing the EIC's impregnable stronghold at Fort William in 1756 was born the legend of the Black Hole of Calcutta. 146 captives from the company were thrown overnight into a space... 18 foot by 14 foot 10 inches. Only 23 walked out of there alive the next day. A lot of hay was made of this in the popular press. Hard to know what actually happened, but it sure did wonders for fanning the flames of public sentiment and allowed for the further permission for militarization of the company. Nobody was against that now, and the Nawab was whooping it up and relishing his victory over the EIC in Calcutta. The EIC took a huge loss. One of the company men, who had sailed out to India to fight against the French and now the Nawab's forces, was Robert Clive, Clive of India. 
quite a controversial chap. He had made a name for himself, first fighting the French in the Carnatic Wars. During the loss of Calcutta, the company sent Robert Clive north from Madras to get Fort William back. Whilst into his mission, Clive became aware of a certain conspiracy going on in the highest levels of Bengal politics involving the Nawab, Siraj Udaula, and his military commander, Mir Jafar. Clive, in an age-old trick going back to the time of the pharaohs, backed the conspirator against the ruler. And this all culminated, of course, in the historic and murky Battle of Plassey, June 23, 1757. Siraj Udala, betrayed by his commander, Mir Jafar, fell to the forces led by the British East India Company. With hardly any losses, Clive's forces took back Calcutta and all of Bengal, winning mostly through deceit and subterfuge, and skillfully outwitting his... Indian opponents who were all mired in their own politics and webs of intrigue. As part of the deal made between Clive and Mir Jafar, Siraj Udala was executed within ten days. After the Battle of Plassey, that's when the good times started to roll. All the great novels, movies, TV miniseries, and old Anglo-Indian traditions, many that are still enjoyed today, all came out of these decades that followed the Battle of Plassey. The Nawab of Bengal's famous treasury at Murshidabad, said to be worth 85 million pounds in 1757, turned out to be only a fraction of that number. It was divvied up amongst the conspirators and the vast portion removed from Murshidabad and sent up river to Calcutta. This is where we get the word loot, an Indian word that means plunder. Despite the final figures being as little as they were, it was still a nice hefty sum, and his cut later made Robert Clive the richest self-made man in Europe. Well, let's not dwell on the Lord Clive too much, but it could be argued that he puffed his chest out a little too much after the riches of Bengal became property of the East India Company. In his heavy-handedness, perhaps lay the beginnings of the companies falling under the control of Parliament. In the latter half of the 18th century in Bengal, and parts of Hyderabad at least, the EIC appeared more like a branch of the British government than a corporation. They were now in the governing business, and in that, the character of the company took a decided change. By October 1760, Mir Jafar, the Nawab of Bengal, who had thrown his lot in with the company, found himself nothing more than a mere puppet who always had to dance to the company's tune whenever called upon. As more and more concessions were demanded from the Nawab of Bengal, more villages and lands were ceded to the company, where they proceeded to drain the poor with taxes. 1773, the company was granted the Diwani, or right to collect revenue for the states of Bengal and Bihar. This was a much, much bigger deal than a mere firman. They had to pony up about 400,000 pounds to get the Diwani, but it was good for at least 2 million pounds a year, an amount that, in the 18th and 19th centuries, was considered quite hefty. After Mir Jafar died... In February 1765, there was nothing to stop the EIC from taking over complete control of Bengal. They called all the shots and had an army to back them up. By now, the ranks of the EIC from India to London were filled with stories of the most bold-faced corruption, foul deeds, murder, intrigue, and abuse of power. They did a lot of trading in tea as well. That was a huge business now. In fact, it was bigger than big. The demand outstripped the supply. And getting in the way of the wheels of commerce was this foul creature known as the Canton system. If you wanted to buy tea in the world in the 18th century, China was the only place who had it. They knew how to process those raw Camellia sinensis leaves into a finished product that drove a nation tea crazy. Tea grew in other places than just China. But only the Chinese knew 
how to turn the leaf into a beverage. Between the moment you plucked the tea leaf from the bush and allowed it to seep inside your cup of hot water, there was a whole secret process involved, especially where black tea was concerned. It was all green tea that the company brought back at first, but it would be black tea that was universally embraced by the nation. In 1757, attempts were made to get around the Canton system, but to no avail. All it did was piss off the emperor, who shut down all trade that wasn't carried out at Canton. All company ships that had been plying the east coast of China to quietly carry out secret trade had to either stop it or carry it out at the risk of death. In Canton, the only place where legal trade could be carried out they had to deal with the Hapo and the Kohong. So the East India Company may have been sitting in the driver's seat in India, but in China they got pushed around and had no say. This is when the idea started being bandied about, about trying to secure some sort of speck of land somewhere, maybe on one of these hundreds of little islands off the China southern coast, to serve as a trading entrepot and a way to do an end run around the Hoppo and his guys. Well, they still needed to find a buyer for these English woolens. The Chinese didn't want them any more than the Indians. And there wasn't anything else except silver bullion that the company could offer the Chinese for their tea. And not only was that a strain on the company, it was a strain on the country as well. The supply of gold and silver, plentiful though it may have been, was still limited. And because of the lack of anything to trade for tea and all these other must-have things only China could supply, the company and Britain was slowly being drained. Yeah, you'd never think the day would come, but it came. The company found itself in a huge cash crunch. With the guaranteed annuity presented by the Diwani, it allowed the EIC to start living on credit. They weren't in imminent danger of going out of business overnight, but the extent of their financial situation caused them to go cap in hand to Parliament to seek some relief. So, late 1700s, 1773 to be exact, came the Regulating Act, also written into the history books as the East India Act, first of several to follow. So right about here, you can see the British government hooked the company and over the next several decades, they will slowly, slowly reel them in under their control. A little bit too much wealth had gushed forth a little bit too quickly, and since Clive's victory at Plassey in 1757, the stories about how corrupt, venal, and greedy some men had become really turned the tide of public opinion against the East India Company. Among the provisions of the Regulating Act was a provision to provide some temporary relief for the EIC. Parliament gave them the right to claim back the taxes paid on the imported tea from China that their go-downs in London were crammed with. Remember, about half the tea in England was smuggled, and half, like the EIC's product, was higher priced because of the tax. So I'm sure many Americans will be familiar with this story. The company T was then shipped across the Atlantic to the colonies, and 342 chests of it ended up getting dumped into Boston Harbor by a bunch of Yanks dressed up as Mohawk Indians. So these are the kind of things the company had to deal with. Nobody liked them anymore. In October 1774, the last company man to hold the position of Governor General of the Presidency of Fort William in Calcutta, began his illustrious career. This was Warren Hastings. His career in the hot seat will be a stormy one, and he'll face a seven-year impeachment trial, in which he'll get acquitted. But once Hastings was gone, the control of the company will slip through the board's hands and into the hands of Parliament, and later on, this... Commercial empire in India, built with the blood, sweat, and tears of the East India Company, will become known as the British Raj. October 19, 1781, let us not forget the Battle of Yorktown and the British defeat in the American colonies. This caused a good old-fashioned crisis in the British government, not to mention a lot of popular discontent. These were volatile times back then, 
whatever happened in one corner of the world, somehow, in some way, had a ripple effect on the company. In 1784, all these Americans, barred from the China trade all these years because of the company's monopoly, started lining up at Wampoa Port in Canton, competing directly with the EIC. And not only will they grab the American market away from the company, they'll even start selling their tea in England. As I said, it was 274 years of trying to play whack-a-mole, so it wasn't surprising the EIC earned that reputation for being so ruthless and often downright brutal in the carrying out of their trading endeavors and keeping competitors at bay. In 1784, it would become official, and another East India Act, known as Pitt's India Act, Prime Minister William Pitt, Pitt the Younger, great-grandson of the EIC legend Thomas Pitt, led the charge that brought company control into the capable hands of the British government. A board of control of both EIC and government appointees jointly ran India from that point forward, with the Crown having the final say in any disputes. Any matters related to business, the EIC continued to handle on their own. In that same year... The Commutation Act lowered the tax on tea from 119% to 12.5%. That's why there was so much smuggling. 119% is more than enough to force most people to look elsewhere than the EIC for their cuppa. Now, with the tea tax slashed to only 12.5%, Company T could compete head-on with the smugglers. And so... The China trade became more important than ever before, and the swan song of the East India Company would be their dominance of the tea trade in China and later India. As the 1800s dawned, the matter of how to finance such a huge tea trade was still a headache. Silver bullion or nothing. Can you believe? They still hadn't found any commodities in sufficient volume that the Chinese liked that could offset the cost of tea purchases. But there was something the EIC had, and they began to look to opium as their possible savior. They had the monopoly on this Bengal and Bihar opium, top quality stuff. This was the gold standard. The opium had been sold to small traders for years, and these boats of all sizes that plied the waters of the Arabian Sea, the Bay of Bengal, Gulf of Thailand, Malacca Straits, and the South China Sea, between all the ports lining all these bodies of water, there was a brisk business going on. The opium trade was thriving, and many of these vessels carried this EIC opium to points all over these waters, and a lot of this opium then got transshipped to China to pay for tea. When the alarm bells started to ring inside the company that there wasn't going to be enough bullion to pay for the public's demand for tea, the decision was made by the company to just ship opium direct to China and use the drug to pay for the tea. And that's what they did. Not directly, of course. It was morally reprehensible what they were doing, not to mention very much against the law in China. So for the sake of plausible deniability, the fingerprints of the EIC weren't on any of the shipping documents. And these country traders, who were the bane of the EIC's existence all these years, gladly offered to carry all this opium from Bengal to some secret place in the South China Sea where Chinese merchants would buy it and get it distributed in their little corner of China. And there were also these guys called agency houses. They, too, dove headfirst into the opium business. These houses, many made up of ex-East India Company men, would all become the famous 19th and 20th century Hongs, like Swire and Jardines. It wasn't just opium. Late 1700s, the company found another commodity the Chinese prized dearly, these were furs discovered in the North Pacific during the voyage of Captain James Cook. All kinds of furs were bought around the Gulf of Alaska and in British Columbia. The land owned by James Delaney in the Taboo miniseries at Nootka came out of this period. From 1785 to 1794, some 35 British ships sailed to those waters buying furs. 
Nootka Sound is located on the Pacific coast of Vancouver Island. With the addition of furs to the trade mix, the cost of the tea was now covered. Opium and furs. Finally, the East India Company had something to sell of great value to the Chinese. They may have cracked that nut, but the Canton system still remained in force. In 1793, another mission was sent to China. This one, the grandest and most splendid of them all. And this McCartney mission, in one fell swoop, was trying to impress the Qianlong Emperor, now in his final years of his overly long reign, to give in to the British requests for the establishment of diplomatic relations, keeping an ambassador in Beijing, obtaining some sort of a deal that the Portuguese got with Macau back in 1557, and opening up some ports along the East China coast, and to take the system out of the Canton system. Well, this McCartney mission of 1793 was a case of the bigger the mission, the more spectacular the failure. Now that the British knew where the Chinese stood, they had to start figuring out a different tack. It's during the dawn of the 19th century, amidst all this drama, that the James Delaney character, played by Tom Hardy from Taboo, he's in Africa, and he'll spend ten years there before he returns to England, as you perhaps saw in episode one. Now, around this time, the armies controlled by the East India Company numbered more than a quarter million. This was double the size of the British Army. In 1803, they captured the Mughal capital of Delhi. And in Malaysia, they were hard at work setting themselves up in Penang. That city will become the fourth presidency of the company, joining Bombay, Madras, and Calcutta. Penang was great and all, but the behind-the-scenes wheeling and dealing with all the Malayan sultans and maintaining control was, was a constant headache to the company. One Thomas Stamford Raffles recognized this, and he said they had to stop trying to fight a never-ending losing battle with these sultans. They needed some place of their own, independent of the sultans, that could become a free trade paradise under EIC control. And on January 28, 1819, Raffles will land in Singapore, negotiate a deal with the locals to build a factory. Then fortune smiled on this new venture when the Sultan of Johor gave the thumbs up on the deal. However, taking a page out of the Clive India handbook, Raffles ensured his success by backing a rival Sultan against the incumbent. Singapore then turned into an overnight success, and still is to this day, I might add, almost 200 years later. Prior to the establishment of Singapore by the company, there was the 1813 Charter Act. With this piece of legislation, the EIC thankfully had its charter renewed, but their monopoly on trade in India was ended. And then 20 years later, in 1833, their monopoly in China will disappear as well talk about a company that had outlived its usefulness. The British in the early 1800s were firmly in place in India, and they had their own people who could administer the place. No one needed the company anymore. The anti-monopolists finally won out, and without the protection of any kind of monopoly or special favor, the East India Company, once so feared and mighty, became just another company trying to compete in the Far East trade. The British manufacturers, most of all, were happy to say goodbye and good riddance. The Industrial Revolution had already yielded amazing advances in technologies that allowed English textiles to compete head-to-head -head with anything coming out of India. And besides, the English worker should come first, not some foreign worker in an Indian sweatshop. The same arguments we have today in our 21st century society were debated just as hotly back in the 1800s. Protect the home industry. If you think that's something new, think again. So it's right around the time this is playing out, as the EIC's teeth are being removed, that taboos James Delaney return to England. As high and mighty as they make the EIC out to be in the miniseries, the company is already past its sell-by date. By 1828, 15% of the company's revenues in India came from the sale of opium. 
the 1820s and 30s saw an explosion of trade in opium, especially after 1833 when the company lost its monopoly on the China trade. No one had to hide or watch themselves anymore. The only problem left, and many now felt this way, was that they had to pull a raffles on the South China coast and find some kind of Singapore to set up shop and carry out China trade outside the Canton system, if at all possible. And this is exactly what happened. The story is already well known. The Daoguang Emperor sent Commissioner Lin Zixu down to Canton to put an end to the opium trade. And in June of 1839, over the period of 23 days, all the opium in the possession of the foreign traders was burned. And this was the catalyst that led to the Opium War and the subsequent Treaty of Nanjing that, among other things, ceded Hong Kong to Britain, opened up five treaty ports to trade, and slammed China with a huge indemnity. You could say by that time it was pretty much over for the East India Company, but they were still the tea trade. As a sort of final act in their long and colorful history, they did something rather spectacular. They'd never get away with such a thing today in our world, but in June 1848, they sent a certain Robert Fortune to China on a secret mission. Fortune, a respected young botanist, had made a name for himself during his 1843-1846 trip to mostly around Zhejiang province, and the book he wrote of his travels, and particularly his observations of how Chinese grew and made tea, was read with interest by the company higher-ups in East India House on Leadenhall Street. The East India Company hired Fortune to sneak into parts of China, in disguise no less, dressed as a native, where the best tea grew in Zhejiang, Anhui, and Fujian. And his mission was to steal tea plants, seeds, and all the technical know-how that the Chinese had managed to keep hidden for more than 2,000 years. And once Fortune was able to do that, he had to get everything transported to the China coast, shipped to India, schlepped 6,000 feet up the mountains to the new tea plantations that the company scientists were setting up in the city of Darjeeling, newly acquired in 1848 by the British Raj. Fortune was sent back to China again in the employ of the company to get more seeds and more know-how. And this second trip as a secret agent of the company lasted from March 1853 to January 1856. And once this was done, it pretty much lit the fuse that ignited the whole Indian tea industry in West Bengal. No more having to deal with the Chinese anymore. Now Britain had their own tea plantations. Thanks to a little bit of industrial espionage carried out by Robert Fortune, the company not only had the seeds, the growing, and processing technologies, they had a limitless supply of cheap labor to exploit and ready market access. With the exception of perhaps how the workers were treated, this twilight business became a nice, final feather in the cap of the company's history in China and India. Well, all good things must come to an end. And for the British East India Company, that came a hundred years after Plassey in 1857. The Bengali army finally had had enough of British high-handedness, and a very bloody mutiny happened that saw the locals rise up against EIC rule. In the resulting crackdown, over a 100,000 Indians were killed. It was a disaster for Britain, and the East India Company was made out to be the scapegoat. And with that, the company rule was abolished on November 1st, 1858, following the Government of India Act that called for the liquidation of the EIC. In 1873 came the East India Stock Redemption Act, enacted in 1874, as well as the Act for Better Governance of India. The EIC soldiers, about 24,000 of them, were folded into the British Army, and the company was formally dissolved. It had been 274 years since Queen Elizabeth I gave them that charter, 
over 4,600 voyages by EIC ships had sailed between England and the East. Most of the stories of the great and near great we'll never know. But a lot has survived, and from all these records, diaries, and documents, we have a pretty fair idea about the history of the British East India Company. In closing, let me quote one of the deans of the American tea industry, the respected James Norwood Pratt, who said of the East India Company that it had come, quote, to be hated and loathed by smugglers and consumers alike as a symbol of corrupt, complacent monopoly. But it also founded the cities of Calcutta, Bombay, Singapore, and Hong Kong. It hired Captain Kidd to combat piracy and made Elihu Yale a fortune with which to endow a university. Its corporate structure is the model for all joint stock companies to this day. The Stars and Stripes were inspired by its flag. The typical New England church patterned after its London chapel. And St. Petersburg modeled on its shipyards where Tsar Peter the Great had worked incognito. It created British India, caused the Boston Tea Party, and kept Napoleon captive on its island possession, St. Helena. And this long-standing effort and enterprise was chiefly paid for by tea. The company's fortunes came to rest on products destined to go down the drain in Europe and up in smoke in Asia. End quote. Well... I hope you enjoyed that, and if you haven't watched the uh, BBC production of Taboo, my strongest recommendations. The second season is underway. They left me hanging at the end of season one. Well, back for more mainstream China-related history next time. I already know what's up next. I hope you'll consider it to be a nice little treat. This is Laszlo Montgomery signing off from Fantastic L.A., and I'll be back as soon as I can with another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.